Hello and welcome. Thank you. What the fuck? We'll just restart that. Here we go. Hello and welcome to Three's a Crime, a true crime podcast. I'm Tori. I'm Emily. And I'm Lindsay. And that's our intro. Here we are. We are professional. Professional podcast. We're podcasters, bitches. talking about what this is tori morbid right. says tori centric they say elena centric or ash centric and that's what i want to say and that's mm. copying and that's mean of me tori we can't copy them although imitation is the sincerest form of flattery they did inspire last podcast a lot to inspired you morbid yes. inspired me and we collectively inspired tori yes really i just With inspired myself because i'm the talent do you listen to any podcasts yeah i listen to a lot of podcasts what did you listen to before? The true crime all the time. Mm. And uh, the root of evil. That oh. one is. Was that a good one? The oh best. My God. It might be. It's just and it's, a one it's time. One time, one story. But I it. it. The it root is of evil. The best. Or I think it might just be root of evil, but it is the best podcast that I've ever listened to. Interesting. It is fucking I was thinking about crazy. how you always talk about Last Podcast and Left, and I always talk about Morbid. Before we started doing this, I just. It didn't occur to me that you would have a comedy slash true crime. And I mean, we're not mm-hmm. we're not comedians by any stretch of the word. We just we're just born we just, funny. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not our job. We just came out like this. Well, I mean, like we at least think that we we're think funny. we're funny. Yeah. Someone has to. We so. crack <laughs> each other up. Um, <laughs> but, you know, because victims are victims and families and things like that. I mean, the only person that I really feel like is worth making fun of is the asshole of the week that we talk about. Yeah, I will talk and, all the you know, shit about yeah, anyone yeah. who does any shady fucking whatever, but the victims, it's like... Like, that's that's off limits. That's not okay. So, yeah. So, this week, I wanted to do a story about my hometown of Williamsport, Pennsylvania. We are the home of Little League <laughs> Baseball. So, this week... The asshole of the week. The asshole, asshole of the asshole week of is Doctor Rachel. <laughs> Why every time? Every single this is time. All the pressure. Doctor Richard Illis. I have been saying it wrong in my head all week. So if I say Isles, just you know, deal with it. Why don't you just call him Doctor Dick? <laughs> Doctor Dick. Doctor Dick. Doctor Dick. Dick. So, um, Doctor Dick was born May second of nineteen fifty seven. Didn't really find. That's only like I a mean, few years before you were born, right? I mean, I swear to God, I'm like, like I'm going, like, I'm going to kill her. So I probably shouldn't say that on a podcast though, because if something to happen to you, they'd be like, they know, yeah, like, they're okay. These girls, they investigate your crime and they talk about Could it. Could you imagine this one looking actually admitted at our search, search histories, like on our no. computers? Oh, it would no. all be my Google's fucked, man. Fucked. Dude. I want to point out that fucking Mary Bell was born in May as well in 57. Ooh. Maybe there's something to... I'm not known. Hey, We're Taurus? At me. I think it's a Taurus and then goes into Gemini later. Yeah. Gemini is perpetual. If you're a Gemini, sorry. Sorry. That Maybe. was Emily that said that. Okay. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> so really... It kind of starts with his education, and he went to a lot of different schools, and I'm not going to go through um, through all of them, but he, he was a cardiac surgeon. Was it cardiothoracic or just cardiac? I think it's cardiothoracic. He met his wife, Miriam, in 1991 at St. Louis University Medical Center. He was a resident, and she was a perfusionist, which I learned that a perfusionist like blood is- blood perfusion? I think so, yeah. But there's someone who operates a heart lung machine during surgery. So it's I think to keep the Oh, oh. it's bypass. Yes. I watch a lot of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> we just talked about this. There when you, you put go. someone on bypass, someone pumping their blood for them. Yes. 
So that's what she did. She was a perfusionist. And they got married about a year after meeting. And after his residency, he wanted to return back to York, Pennsylvania, which is where his family was. And he got a job at a hospital there. But apparently he'd been kind of a dick to some of the competing physicians in the town. And they didn't want him there. And so he ended up taking a job at Susquehanna Health Systems, which is in my hometown of Williamsport, Pennsylvania. My town is Williamsport, and then there's a river that runs through it, which is the Susquehanna. The river runs through it. And then on the other side is a whole other town that they named South Williamsport. It's, you know, it's a small town, very comparable to Spokane. I just want, Emily's drawing penises, and it's (laughs) Having Dr. Dick's totally <laughs> It's right next to the note that says Dr. Dr. Dick. Dick. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. All right. Let me backtrack here. Um, Emily's a 14-year-old boy. <laughs> she is. Um, so, too. I grew up. I did. I grew up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Um, I lived there until I was about 19. It's a small town. It's comparable kind of to Spokane, probably. Um, we are the home of Little League Baseball. So, every year in the summertime... <laughs> It's on, the Little League World Series is on ESPN every year. No, it makes sense. It's just weird how things have, like, we're I, fucking Hoop Fest. Like, it's just yeah. Yeah, like when that, I learned I, that Hoop Fest was the biggest thrill to basketball tournament in yeah. the world, I was yeah. like, But I mean, how many, what? but then, it, but how many three-on-three basketball I tournaments are there? Like, I don't know. Like, I just, you know? it's not one of those things I think the biggest thing, anything in the world is going to yeah. be in the town I live in. Yeah. Right. You know, so for anyone who doesn't know, we have Hoop Fest, which is. The largest three on three basketball <laughs> tournament in the world. And it makes our lives a living hell. It does. For people who live here. Well, and that's like we have Bloomsday, which is also. which is the race, which is also a pain in the ass. But I mean, you get people like competitive actual runners is that, that are from like Kenya and say, yeah. whatever Holy fuck, that come really? in, yeah, yeah, that come and run Bloomsday. Big deal. Is it like one of the biggest I, I don't know if it's a big one or not. There must be some sort of monetary prize, though. I mean, we, yeah. we do live in a really beautiful spot. Maybe it's just like we have a good place for all the outdoor activities. We do. We I do think, have yeah. lots of trail. That. I mean, we yeah. just say it makes sense. There's yeah. a body of water within like 10 miles in a direction. Yeah. yeah. There's a body of water. I thought you were just going to say there's a body. There's a, or there might be bodies. There may be a body. That's yeah. whatever. Is it like miles. Spokane specifically, too, is like there's trails and bodies of water, rivers, lakes, whatever, anywhere any direction like five miles away. I mean that that sounds accurate and but Williamsport like I said it is a small it is a small town um and there's a lot of other small towns that make up kind of the greater area it's it's a town in literally central Pennsylvania surrounded by a lot of farmland and um, Amish so that's where he ended up taking a job after being there for a little while Miriam uh, had their their son and decided that she was going to stay home be a stay-at-home mom and by all accounts including Dr. Dix she was an excellent mother was very involved with her church and people just genuinely thought she was, she was lovely. a good person yeah she was a good person oh, no, did really she die her. Uh, well, you're gonna have to wait here. I mean, if from what we've learned, it's always from every the good people. It's time. always she was a yeah. she was a stand up person. Yeah, she she was a a heart of gold. People. She was really, really involved um, with her church, which we'll get to uh, in just a little bit. But so they got married in uh, 1991. By 1998, the marriage was in trouble. Both Richard and Miriam consulted divorce attorneys. Now. The woman that represented him, I'm not going to say her name because I really do feel that that bitch would sue me. She is <laughs> fucking shark. No. When my friend was getting divorced, no, um, she had looked at hiring this this particular uh, attorney. And my mom was like, oh, you, and my mom hasn't lived in that town in 20 years. Uh, my mom was she like, knows. yeah, she was like, oh, they call her the Barracuda. <laughs> Oh my god. But she's she's really I mean she is known for being ruthless and I guess if you are in a contentious divorce that's probably the kind of attorney that you want. Say. So anyway, anyway, point being she's she's got a she's reputation ruthless. for being yes, a for being ruthless. Ooh, Barracuda. So Ooh, Barracuda. So in February of 1998, Miriam received a letter from this attorney that stated that she and Richard had been separated as of February 20th, 1998. 
Now, Miriam had gone to visit her family in Georgia around this time. It was a planned trip that Richard didn't go on. But he he was using that date to say that she had abandoned, essentially, the family. Um, so his letter says, we've been separated as of this date, and he had no intention of reconciliation. You know, and this was kind of a shock to Miriam, because even though they had kind of sort of separated, you know, the marriage was in trouble, she was still really hoping for some sort of reconciliation with him. But her her friends and family weren't sure why she wanted to uh, reconcile with him. Apparently, he was very controlling, domineering. A friend of hers said, quote, Miriam was controlled by her husband. He wanted his dinner at a certain time. Oh. He wanted the house perfect. If she didn't please him, she paid a price. In March of 98, she had told her attorney she was afraid of what would happen moving forward with their finances and particularly the custody of their son, who was four. Especially because Richard was using this Georgia vacation to say that she permanently left the family. Um, and that at that time had ser- served her with a complaint for custody, which is a pretty common tactic. Did it say, like, why they got a divorce or was it just, like... I, I think it was they weren't really spending a whole lot of time together. But again, he made a decision to separate when she was still hoping for a reconciliation. So... Her lawyer then tells her to go to the bank and withdraw all the money. And Miriam didn't feel comfortable doing that. So she took half of what was in there. So wow, it was about, that's a real nice. You know, right down the middle. So it was about $300,000. Wait, now. wait a second. They had $600,000 in their account? He's a doctor. And He's, a doctor. She's a... He's a cardiothoracic but surgeon. But like in and... the 90s is what you said? And like what? Was yeah, it just, just fluid cash? Um, no, I'm assuming that they, it's it doesn't so really funny. say if this was one account or multiple Well, that's accounts. gotta be like maybe like a, they probably like have like a money market stocks or and like CDs. Like yeah, that. whatever. So she took half. So she took 300000 The bank's assistant manager testified that later that day, Richard went to the bank probably to drain the accounts. And when he finds out that Miriam had been in and withdrawn the money, he freaks the fuck out. He goes straight to the bank assistant manager and she described him as being irate. He wouldn't sit down. He was a furious that no one in the bank had alerted him to this withdrawal. Well, of course not. You both are joint Mm -hmm. on the account. She had every right to take her half. She had every right to take everything it is not the bank's responsibility. I need $300,000 in hundreds, please. <laughs> yeah. So in July of 1998, so this is kind of like every month, this is kind of escalating a little bit. So Richard changed the beneficiaries on his life insurance policies. Oh, no. So for the one, so by July of 98, he was dating his new girlfriend, and we'll talk about her in a little bit. But... He had changed the beneficiaries on his $750,000 life insurance policy to his new girlfriend and his son. And he didn't have to alert Miriam because he was the one that had opened these yeah, policies. Yeah, you don't have to, yeah. And then... And it's in his name. And it's in his name. And then he had a $250,000 policy on Miriam, of which he was the beneficiary. Now, he could have canceled Miriam's policy. if They were no longer together. And they offered that to him, but he decided instead to pay the pay the premiums into 1999. And so the policy was in effect at the time of her murder. But just a little sidebar here, he didn't get to get that money because the insurance company wouldn't pay out because he was already under investigation. Good. I have another question. Yeah. <laughs> Why was his life insurance only 70000 but hers was no, 750 750 I was incorrect. Go back. I'll yeah. leave. <laughs> So combined now. <laughs> so combined it's a million dollars, but seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on him and two hundred and fifty thousand on Mary. This sounds more correct. <laughs> like so, that's weird. Um so <laughs> kind of all in the same time, a friend testified that he was at a party that both Richard and Miriam attended, and that when Miriam walked in, he overheard Richard call her an evil bitch or evil woman, and then something about a million dollars. And I think we'll get to this in a little bit too, but there was also like a malpractice money thing. We're going to get to that. I'm not going to go down that road yet. Who the Um, fuck is this (laughs) broski driving down the street in his ratchety ass fucking (laughs) bounce rake, rake, rake? rake. (laughs) Wow, I'll try and edit that out. But So 
Seven Eleven is literally down the street, so oh, we get a interesting of... mishmash of like people driving and walking. That is a steady stream. Really just... funny. It was just very squeaky. <laughs> I know like, it. And I was like, oh no. Tori's like, fucking shut up. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so <laughs> they both. <laughs> Dr. Dick both wanted the house and they kind of fought over that for a while. But in the event, in the end, Miriam decided that she was going to move out because he was refusing to leave well, and he's a narcissist and an asshole. And so, yeah, like you probably just want to be without him. But she also withdrew her divorce petition and she was still telling people that there might be a chance that they oh. might reconcile, even though he was not saying the same. So after Miriam moved out in late March, her attorney filed for child and spousal support. This got argued back and forth several times and the amounts kept fluctuating. But in the end, the judge found that she was entitled to both and was awarded $5,500 for child support and $7,200 a month for spousal support. So the total amount was like (laughs) $12,700. So he was going to have to pay her $13,000 a month in child support. In 1998. In 1998. So do you know what we call that? (laughs) Motive. Yeah. How much money is that now? Um, Let's see. $20,416.23. Twenty thousand four hundred and sixteen dollars and twenty three cents. So that would be just today. Twenty thousand dollars a month. A month. A month. A fucking month. Yeah. Oh, girl. But this is why they also had $600,000 in their bank account. I mean, yeah, apparently it wasn't that big of a problem. Yeah. Richard was not pleased with this. Miriam received a letter from Richard's attorney stating that he wanted to wrap up the divorce quickly and not to insult her or Richard's intelligence because they were accusing her of trying to draw it out to get more spousal support. But her attorney pointed out that the doctor had hundreds of thousands of dollars in property that he wasn't claiming as a marital asset. The money had come from a malpractice suit that happened before the marriage, but he had put the money in the marital account, which made it marital property. At this point, discussions just ceased. Like, they were not, they were not getting anywhere. In November of 1998, Richard was served with a contempt petition because, of course, he wasn't complying with the support order. So another friend testified that around in December of 1998, she was at the house of another doctor who was Richard's partner at the time, and she was helping him move. She was a nurse, and she had worked with both doctors. And so she hears Richard's voice downstairs. She knew that it was Richard because she worked with him. She knew his voice. And she had said that his tone of voice was faster and higher than she had ever heard it before. And that he was talking about his wife, custody, and financial issues. And she heard him say, I wish that bitch were dead. My life would be a whole lot easier. The same doctor, who comes up later in the story, also testified that he knew both Richard and Miriam socially because they were partners and that Richard had talked to him about the marriage. He told him when he was in a relationship with a co-worker and that Miriam was moving out. During this time, Richard was referring to her as a wicked bitch. What I like to be referred to as. Right? <laughs> That's a wicked bitch. <laughs> the night that Richard came to his house and the nurse was there, Richard kept referring to Miriam as a bitch who was making his life miserable and he wished she would just just go away. He blamed her for everything he was going through because, you know, he's a fucking victim. There was another co-worker who had been through a divorce and, and Richard comes up to him to like commiserate and he was like, I was just forced to give $500,000 to that fucking bitch Miriam. And the co-worker was like, this was unprompted. Like, I don't. Hey. Yeah, that's. I'm gonna go take my lunch now. Yeah, that <laughs> comes up to him. That's weird. <laughs> there were a lot of like fr- former coworkers. Really, like I'm not sure he had friends. Um, but former coworkers that were coming forward, you know, to say that like, these weird little things, like so, he and Richard had gone target shooting. And he remembered that Richard was a really good shot. And this co-worker was complaining about his divorce and everything that he was having to go through. And at this point, this was early in their marriage. So Richard and Miriam were fine. 
But he remembered Richard saying, like, well, if it were me, I would just take my wife out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's just oh um, preemptive. Yeah. Let's just tell everybody our fucking plan. Right? So That's now, called premeditation. <laughs> like a thousand percent. Right? Like if he comes and he's like, it wasn't planned. I just killed her because I was mad. Yeah. On January 7th of 1999, an evidentiary hearing was held. At this hearing, Miriam was able to show that Richard had been withdrawing large sums of money. Richard was described as being perturbed and uncomfortable with the questioning <laughs> by Miriam's attorney. <laughs> Richard claims that it was normal for him to go to Atlantic City and gamble. Miriam's attorney testified that the hearing was, quote, a fairly heated day. I mean, it was an uncomfortable day. He was not very happy that day. <laughs> and I mean, I think anytime, I think it's clear we can tell it's that like, anytime gonna... Richard is being questioned about anything, he's probably not a very pleasant person. Because yeah, nothing's his fault. Ever. It was approximately one week later that Miriam was murdered, and we'll talk about her murder here in just a second. But remember how I said Richard's attorney was known for being ruthless? Yeah, well, on January 19th of 1999, just days after Miriam's murder, this bitch files a letter in the Lycoming County Domestics Relations Office, this is like two days after she's dead, and says... Miriam's deceased and the wage attachment needs to be removed and also filed a petition to terminate child and spousal support. What wow. the fuck? Like, I mean, I get it. Like, I get that you would want to stop that stuff, yeah. but like, it's brutal. Two days. That's like, would that thought. even be what you're thinking about? I No, no, no. So, the murder. The murder. The murder. So, on Friday, January 15th, 1999, at approximately 5 o'clock, Richard goes to Marion's house to pick up their son for a scheduled visitation. He was an hour late because, clearly, his time is more important than anybody else's. Mm -hmm. I, like, really, really <laughs> All of her notes guy. are, like, not facts. They're like, well, obviously, he couldn't be there, so he wasn't. <laughs> no, he was, he was an hour late. So, apparently, Richard and Miriam spoke, and then Richard took the son and left. There was a witness there when that meeting took place um, and then that person stayed with Miriam for about an hour or two after Richard and the son left and this was the last time she was seen alive at 10 10 eastern one of Miriam's friends from Montana called her they had been chatting up for approximately 25 minutes when Miriam's friend heard a noise in the background and said it sounded like a glass or a dish breaking mm. she then heard Miriam say oh my god and then loud moaning her friend was like, you know, are you okay? Are you okay? But there was no answer. So she hung up and called right back, but she got a busy signal. For those of you that were not alive in 1999, uh, if you call someone who's already on the phone, oh, yes, that's oh, yeah. what a busy signal <laughs> is. So, Fucking Gen Zers. I'm going to part my hair wherever the fuck I want to part my hair. <laughs> Have you guys been seeing all of that? Yes. What? That yeah. Gen Z says that they know millennials are millennials because we part our hair on the side. And we wear skinny jeans instead of like mom jeans. Yeah. And oh fuck, what 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 else was? It was like things that like they don't do anymore that they make fun of us for. Well, we made fun of like. Yeah, but I don't store. think yeah. that I don't think that like because I'm Gen X, so yeah, I know. Well, I'm not even in. You're not your, even in that. I'm not even. Where in do you part your hair? Your thing. Uh, down the middle. I do now too, but, but that's I just used, because but that's for where years, I for years it was a side part, and I always did it. Side. I always did an angle. I my hair just natural. I mean, I never do it anymore, so that's part of it. But it just naturally dries in the middle, so that's usually where I leave it. Michael told me I look like Dwight Schrute once, <laughs> <laughs> but now I just say "fuck you." This is what marriage is. Uh, that's what I say to Brent I say all, the all the time. So, Miriam's friend. They were on the phone. Just to recap, they were on the phone. Then this on the happened. Land line. And, you know, so the friend hung up, busy signal. called back, got the busy signal. Um, Williamsport had a snowstorm at the time. So she just figured that the storm had knocked out the phone lines. When she called back Sunday morning, she got the machine. She left a message asking Miriam to call her back, and they were able to show proof of these calls. The machine so, is a voicemail system. Yes. Oh my god. I didn't Just even kidding. think about that. But I'm I mean like they're kidding, kidding, but like it's no, not, they're my, yeah, my yeah. generation back is the, the last day. one yeah, yeah that had that voicemails. Had... You had a phone that was at your house that yes. everybody could answer. Not yeah. everyone had their own phone. Yeah. And then if you couldn't get a hold of anyone 
you got their voicemail. Well, and that's like thing. So when I was when I was in high school, we, like we didn't have cell phones, but it was like a huge deal for me and my girlfriends because we all had our own phone lines. There would be a house line, and then my like you know your line. Which was great. And I really think that the only reason that my parents gave in is like they wanted to be able to use the phone. Yeah, and, like, if I'm pretty I wasn't sure that's school, why anybody ever got their kids a phone or yeah, connection of yeah. any kind because they're like, I want my phone back. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? I want to like, I want to be able to get calls if I need them. I, my bedroom was up in like a, you know, kind of in an attic that had been refurnished. And I had this 1970s green, like, Stranger Fictions phone, you know what I'm talking about? Like, mm-hmm. the, the dial, the old, old-timey old phones. Like, the rotary really phone. rotary phone that was, like, olive green. And I loved it. It was kind of hanging at the bottom of the stairs. And um, that was my phone, but I would have to come down the stairs to get it. Anyway, I had gotten in this fight with my mother about the phone. And my mom <laughs> was a very calm and patient woman. Sweet Bobby, right? Sweet Bobby. Sweet Bobby. Sweet Bobby. But Bobby has a dark side. <laughs> oh. And if you push Bobby, oh my God, she ripped that phone off the wall <laughs> <laughs> and smashed it. Oh my God. On the stairs. And Holy she's like, shit. now it's not a problem. Oh my <laughs> like, God. Okay. That is amazing. But anyway, That's yes, great. a machine. When you get the machine, it's just leaving some of the voice little cassette tapes. Yes. Yeah. Tiny tiny some of them. Like, and you couldn't call them back until you got home. Yeah. yeah. No, so that's the history story. of answering machines. <laughs> and all of our personal experiences right. with them. Right. Answering machines are just voicemail on a separate system. <laughs> a little machine. On a little yeah. machine. At your and, house. At your house. And half the time didn't play back because the machine would just eat the little cassette tapes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And a cassette tape. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you don't know what a cassette tape is, Google, Google it. it. So on that same Sunday, January 17th, this friend tried to call Miriam. Another friend was super worried when Miriam didn't show up for church. She had been the director of Bible studies. And this friend who had to cover for her for not being there just thought it was weird that Miriam hadn't called her to say that she wasn't going to be there. and just wasn't like her. So after church, this friend and her husband go over to Miriam's house. When they get to the house, they see that mail and newspaper hasn't been collected. They knock on the door, and they can hear Miriam's dogs barking, but nobody came to the door. When no one came, they went around the back of the house, and that's when the husband of the friend gets to the rear kitchen window. He could see Miriam lying on the floor and could tell that she was deceased. He communicated this to his wife, and they called 911. When the paramedics arrived, the husband walked them to the back of the house, and one of the EMTs noticed a hole in the window. The state police arrive, and they find all the doors locked, so they forcibly make their way into the house. And the troopers find Miriam on the kitchen floor with the phone between her head and the shoulder. (gasps) She was literally... She was... It was... Yes. So they knew, based on, like, the phone records, like, when that friend hung up and called back, like, they were able to know her exact time of death. The trooper also spotted the hole in the window and glass, you know... From the window was on the inside and on the counter. The autopsy report showed that Miriam had died of a gunshot wound to the back. The forensic pathologist explained that as the bullet had gone through the window, it started to fragment in the air. So when it hit her, the bullet went through her upper back and fractured her left lateral ribs. The fragments of the bullets caused several wound paths. Fragments hit her lung, the sac surrounding the heart, the base of the left ventricle of the heart, the left atrium of the heart, the pulmonary arteries, which carry the blood from the heart to the lungs, the aorta, which carries blood from the heart to the rest of the body, and then the upper lobe of the lung. The pathologist noted that the wounds were so severe that without, like, immediate, immediate, immediate medical intervention, she would have only survived, like, seconds. So it said that she would have only... She, she would have only seconds to a few minutes, and she was likely unconscious within seconds of being shot. He did note, however, that the noise that her friend heard on the phone that was likely the, quote, death rattle. I was thinking that, too. So, as a person is dying, <gasps> oh, their God. lungs fill with fluid, and then that fluid mixes with air to make this gurgling noise. And then as the person expel- expels the air and blood, it comes out as a rattle or wheezing type noise. He also confirmed that Miriam may have been able to say, oh, my God, um, because there would have still been air in her lungs. 
Then that whole death rattle thing happens. Yeah, I know. It's not cool. The pathologist was able to collect bullet fragments from her body, and he did turn them over to the state police. Behind Marion's house, there's a wooded gully that could be seen from the window. And then in the back of the wooded gully is a tennis court with a chain link fence around it. So as they're investigating, the the trooper saw tracks in the deep snow south of Miriam's house that came down to the property line. So he follows those tracks back to an area near the tennis court around a utility pole. The tracks went from the pole and down over the gully to a small tree facing the south end of Miriam's house. In a court document, it said that the tracks had gone over behind the next residence, wound up the embankment as though peering over it, back down, came to the original place where they came down the embankment behind the visitor's residence and returned out towards the tennis court. That I found extraordinarily confusing. Um, And there's a little video that I sent to you that kind of shows kind of shows it um, in like a 3D animation. Can we post it? I think so. Um, Or at least we'll post the link. It was like one of the things that they actually used at trial to show um, because there's some other information in there that we're going to get to. You kind of have to see it. But basically, behind her house is this gully. Then there's a tennis court. And they were able to track the tracks, you know, from that area down to her house kind of and back again. In that wooded gully, there was a small tree about eight inches tall, and the trooper found footprints around the tree. One footprint was about a foot from the tree and directly in line with the tree. As it turns out, the trooper that noticed this was a trooper that actually teaches firearm courses and was like, this is a typical stance for someone using a barricade to help them shoot. In his opinion, the shooter had to be right-handed because typically you would extend your left foot to shoot with your right hand. Thank you. Hello, husband. Hi, husband. Hi. I'm Emily. Nice to meet you. I've heard many things. Good or bad? Oh, they're all good. They're all good. It's my Coca-Cola. 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 Sponsor us. Sponsor us. Oh, no. Oh, you're going to have oh, to I make know. a choice, you two. But there's also a Pepsi on yeah. the table. I got a Pepsi. Pepsi. Okay. So, yeah. So, a typical stance for someone using a barricade to shoot. And then it was his opinion that the shooter had to be right-handed. And he noted that someone shooting from this tree would have a clear view of Miriam's window and was one of the few places that was back there that you could clearly see into the house without anything in the way like trees or shrubs and the actual distance from Miriam's house to that tree was only 73 feet the trooper believed that only one person went in went to the small tree and then left because each snow print left the same horseshoe pattern the heel of the shoe had had a horseshoe pattern the snow prints led to the main road where they ended so while they're back there one of the troopers finds a black object that looked like a silencer on the tennis courts Hmm. the fence around the tennis court was 10 feet high but the trooper noted that there were no tracks on the tennis court so obviously somebody had like flung it over the police also found a cigarette butt near that tree behind miriam's house but there was no evidence that it had been smoked there There were no ashes in the snow or burn marks from, like, stubbing it out on a tree. It's weird. Well, that's what they thought. Like, it's weird that there's a cigarette butt back here, but, like, no evidence that that it was smoked back here. So, like, why is this here? But they collected it anyway. So, on Sunday evening, Richard returns to town and heads over to Miriam's house where he's supposed to be returning their child to Miriam, which is where he um, is informed of his wife's death. So initially, the police say that he was, like, crying and upset, but then very quickly was, like, he he asked something like, what evidence do you have? They also said that when he was asked to provide details about his whereabouts, that his demeanor changed to very matter-of-fact. Richard tells them, like, yeah, I showed up an hour late to pick up my son. He had told Miriam that he was heading out of town, but he wasn't sure where. Either he was going to go up to his cabin that he owned and snowmobile with their son, or he was going to go to his sister's house in Honeybrook and visit his father in Downington, Pennsylvania. So he left Miriam and he says he went to his office at like 730 to dictate some notes. He's got the kid with him. I don't know, whatever. 
So it must have been earlier than that because he said he then goes to Burger King to get food for him and the son and gets home between 6.30 and 7 o'clock. He calls Miriam and says that they've decided that they're going to go to his dad's house in Downington and he starts packing for the trip and he claims that they left at 9.30. Now, I don't have a child, (laughs) but I want to know what parent is packing up a four to five year old to get in the car at 9 30 at 9 30 in stormy weather to drive like two hours out of town terrible parent. they yeah. always think they're the best liars like they're gonna oh get God. one over this guy is a hundred hundred percent narcissist. narcissist he reminds me of the dude who susan powell's husband oh yeah. who it was. Yeah. i was trying to remember i was like who yeah was the it one was susan powell where he he used the kids yes. we went camping in the middle of the in night, the of the night yeah. in the middle of a storm. fucking snowstorm yeah. and you're like what are you even saying are you even hearing yourself he claims that travel took longer because the roads were bad and icy which again who's gonna put their kid in the car and take that risk if the if they're that bad he claims his son got hungry and so they stopped at mcdonald's in lewisburg which is actually where i was born in evangelical Hospital. at mcdonald's in lewisburg? <laughs> no but i have a story about that mcdonald's oh no <laughs> what is it so mcdonald's sponsor. my parents <laughs> lived in they lived in williamsport geez. actually they lived in Hayesville, which was riddle. even farther from williamsport But the doctor that my mom wanted was in Lewisburg. And my mom was in labor, so they wouldn't let her eat. Oh, no. And she really, really wanted an Egg McMuffin. And my dad was like, I promise you, like, I will get you an Egg McMuffin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doctor came in and looked at my mom and was like, oh, you're not going to go for a long time. So he went to lunch. (laughs) And my mom was like. Hey, uh, comes this baby. <laughs> so I was born. I was born at eleven forty a.m. and my mom, my entire life, calls me every year at eleven at eleven forty <laughs> to tell me that story and to complain that she never got her fucking egg McMuffin. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and my dad was like, "By the time you were born, they weren't <laughs> serving breakfast anymore." <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah, there's sausage egg and cheese McGriddles only go to two. Yep. What if I wanted it three? I know that's not yeah. right. I, the sausage egg McGriddles like sausage is divine. It's heaven. It really it is. is. It makes it you is. feel like shit, but mm-hmm. god damn, it's good. good I it only it get so those good. when I'm super hungover, mm. and I'm not super hungover very often. But when I am, that is like. Oh, it makes me sleep, like, yes. as soon as I'm done eating it, yep. I'm like, I think I want to die, and I'm just, just going to go crawl into bed. Coma. Yeah, and the next day you wake up and feel, well, the next day I feel hungover after eating fast food, but Dude. I do it all the time, so. <laughs> he said that travel took longer because the roads were bad and icy. Claims that his son got time. hungry, and so they stopped at the McDonald's in Lewisburg. We don't like that one. They don't have them. <laughs> they don't like them. They don't have McMuffins. This is different than Burger King, right? man. Um, yeah. So, yeah, well, that's kind of my point in bringing this up, because he says that they stopped at McDonald's. He still says that they went to Burger King and got dinner at, like, 6.30 or 7. And Lewisburg is about 30 minutes from my hometown. So, technically, if there had been no bad road conditions, they would have been there by 10 o'clock. But he says that, well, at least at this point in the interview, he couldn't confirm the time that they were there. But later, he does say that it was around 11 o'clock. So that's like an hour and a half from when they left. But even an hour, like, do you need, if you just ate dinner at seven, why is the kid hungry? Also yeah. a four-year-old, they always say they're hungry and then they eat like half a chicken nugget and then they're like, <laughs> I don't want the rest of that. That's <laughs> true. Now, Chimkin nuggers. Richard, <laughs> Richard claims that his son, and he doesn't, he does not mention this in the first interview, but he does later con- say that. He knows that it was 11 because he sent Richard in to use the bathroom. She thinks that she just ignores I us. I know. <laughs> she's like, maybe you just, just keep going. She won't even oh, look up. Is... She's just like reading. <laughs> Richard decided that he would need to get a hotel for the evening. And so somewhere around south, somewhere south of Salem's Grove, uh, which is only about 15 minutes from Lewisburg, He calls his sister to say that they would not be down for the night. He then claims he could not find a suitable hotel until they got to Harrisburg. And Harrisburg's about an hour and ten minutes from Lewisburg. But there were plenty of places that he could have stayed 
in between there. Was it really not bougie enough for him? Apparently not. So he calls his sister about 11.30, and then he claims that they got to the hotel at 1 a.m. And then they stayed at his sister's house on Saturday night, went to his father's house Sunday morning, and then returned back to Williamsport at 4 p.m. And was at Miriam's house by 4.50. The police wanted to question the son that night, but Richard refused. On January 23rd, 1999, Richard calls the police and says he wants his attorney on the phone so that he can provide some information to the police. He claims that his house has been broken into. He noticed that some lights were on that he hadn't left on, and some things had been, quote, moved about the house. Moved about. Yeah, moved about. Now, he claimed that while he did have an alarm system in the house, it wasn't activated. So the offer was the officer was like, okay, well, I can assign a trooper to come out, and that's how you know we'll get them to take a look around and investigate. And then Richard's like, well, I want to think about that. And then later has his lawyer, who by the way, I went to I went to high school with this lawyer's son. He had him call back and said that he didn't want the police to come out there. So he's that's... calling and being like, somebody broke into my house, but I don't want you to come out and investigate. Like, so here's a little funny backstory about this lawyer. So when I was in college, I had gone to South Carolina for uh, spring break, but my roommate and friend at the time had stayed, like she was going to stay up at school, or it was maybe it was the night before they were leaving for spring break. And so a bunch of friends had gotten together in one of the dorms or dorm rooms and were drinking beer. <laughs> they got busted by campus security. And so they're asking everybody for their IDs. And my roommate was like, I don't, I don't have mine. It's in my room. And they were like, okay, we'll go get it. And then they just let her leave. <laughs> like, nobody went with her. So she was just like... <laughs> you left her. Like, okay. So she goes and she, you know, like, she hides out in somebody else's room and, like, just kind of stays there for the night. So then it's spring break. So everybody's gone. So we come back and I get back before she does. And the phone in our room rings. And so I answer the phone and they, all I hear is, who's this? And I go, who the fuck is this? <laughs> like, call my room and ask me who yeah. I am. <laughs> and he was like, this is Officer Guts from Campus Security. And I was like, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes hello. Yes, sir. <laughs> and he wanted to see my roommate. So, like, she comes back and I'm like, just tell him that you had cold medicine. And you were, I mean, like, all the bullshit stupid yeah. stuff that absolutely <laughs> does not work. But anyway, she hired... This and I can't, I don't know, I can't remember if Dr. Dick's attorney is the one that represented her or if it was, if it was just somebody in his firm, but it was, it was her, his firm that she went to and they got her off. I mean, the judge was basically wow. like, you let her leave. You didn't escort her. Yeah. Like you can't <laughs> prove that because like they didn't have like a breathalyzer or yeah. anything. They couldn't prove that she had been there. And so, wow. um, so he's a pretty good now. defense attorney. Yeah. yeah. They want to, they just, the police decide they want to talk to him again. So on February 10th, he spoke with his, he spoke with investigators in a taped interview in his lawyer's office. He basically told the same story, but he added a few details. He added that they ate food in the car. They had just had dinner at seven. Um, this, it, and then he says that his son went into McDonald's to go to the bathroom. And I'm sitting there going, did he, he not go, go with, he didn't go with him. Okay. You no, said, that's weird. No. You sent a four or five year old kid nope. into McDonald's nope. at no. night by himself to nope. use the restroom. No. Nope. He says that he remembers that it was close to 11 because he was worried that McDonald's was getting ready to close and his kids in there in the bathroom doing who knows what. So he had told the police that they that they went to the Hampton Inn and that's where he stayed. But then he adds that he had actually stopped at the Sheridan Sheridan Inn um, around twelve twenty or twelve thirty. But a busload of people were checking in, so he left there and went to the Hampton instead. During the interview, he confirmed that he owned several guns including shotguns and rifles. He acknowledged that he had twenty two caliber ammunition up to three hundred Magnum. So one of the really interesting things about my hometown is that like the city doesn't do trash collection. So you actually have to hire a garbage man. Like, Still? And, yeah. Wow. Yes. You have Why? to Why? What I, if you don't I, hire one? Is there just like I mean, I suppose you could probably take it out to the dump yourself. But I mean, like, we always had somebody, but you had to pay them, you know, pay them weekly and they come by and they pick up your garbage. And that is so weird. But yeah, we don't have like a city garbage collection. Hmm. Um, So police reached out to Richard's trash guy 
And they're like, hey, we want to see <laughs> his trash. And uh, this guy's like, okay, <laughs> we'll turn it over. <laughs> you know, Richard later, he tries to argue that they shouldn't have been able to do that. But I think anybody that watches TV knows that when trash is discarded. It's not yours anymore. It's yeah. not yours yeah. anymore. They can do whatever they want. Yep. So some of the things that they found in the trash were a rifle barrel that had six drill bit impressions. Why the fuck do people throw shit like that in the trash? I will why never understand why that? people do that. I don't know. Because he thinks he's smarter than like, everybody. Like, I feel like I'm not about to kill someone, but, like, I would, like, dissolve that shit or something. Like, you don't just, like, throw it out or throw it in the fucking forest and be like, well, well. Yeah, my crime is committed. Yep. So going back to the silencer that they had found on the tennis court, they had taken that apart to see what it was made up of, and the, the components were PVC pipe with end caps. Oh, it was that a homemade been... one. Oh yeah, oh. yeah, with end caps that had been glued to the PVC pipe. There was black textured spray paint on the surface and made with crushed acoustical tile. It had a piece wow. of wire wrapped around a wire screen to hold a conduit. There was a metal conduit which was a metal piece of pipe that ran through the center of the silencer. Numerous holes were drilled into the metal conduit. Expanding foam was also used inside the silencer. It's a lot of work. Yeah, I like how he painted it. He's like, I've made yeah. this silencer yeah. and like, now I'm going to make it yeah, match. Make it. We're ready. Yeah, you got to make it match. You can't have a white PVC pipe silencer. No. That's bullshit. That's ugly. No. The foam and he was no. like, my God. Two steps away from bedazzling it. <laughs> um... <laughs> So got like all these rhinestones yeah. stones He's around it, yeah, right? Michael's receipts. Could you- <laughs> <laughs> we find all these Michael's receipts, and it matches everything that we found with the silencer. Yeah. There's a lot of detail about the construction of the silencer, which I did not understand, and frankly, was like, I feel like we just know that it was not made. Yeah, it was. It was, it was a homemade. It, it was, was homemade. And the key point was that there were several holes in the silencer that all lined up and they could tell that it had, it had been made with a drill press. So on February 29th, 1999, police served warrants on his house and his cabin. And they find between, mainly in the house, um, they find all of the components. Like all of the different things that were used in the silencer uh, or to make the silencer in his house. And he had a workshop that, like, he admitted he worked on guns and did all kinds of stuff in this workshop. But it had, you know, I mean, they were they were able to find, like, you know, the expandable foam. And there was, I can't remember what it was, but there was something that was wrapped in the same wire mm-hmm. that was used. And, I mean, when they go to trial with this, they were able to say, like, no, this wire that was used in the silencer came from this like a thousand like, percent they like, made like yeah. all of the yeah exactly so it was weird because the police they they seized a full box of tools a ruger 22 250 rifle with a scope um and a drill bit box now while they did not seize this they observe a 22 caliber semi-automatic beretta in a box in the basement and the barrel of the beretta had been sawed off and i'm like I didn't think you were allowed to sell stuff off. Like, I thought that that was... Well, I think it's... You're also not allowed to make a silencer out of PVC pipes. No, you're not. (laughs) I think he's just But I mean, like, I don't... But they didn't do... Like, they didn't take it. They didn't do anything with it. They just noted. They just took a picture of it. The other thing, um, which becomes very important (laughs) right now, um, is that they notice and take a picture of a book that they see on the nightstand in the master bedroom titled... They write their own sentences, FBI handwriting analysis manual. Shortly after uh, the search of his home and his cabin, Richard tells his friend that he's worried about the search because the items that they took are available in any home. And he was afraid that he could be framed Mm -hmm. and that someone had broken into his house. And he was worried that they might have planted something that could point Uh, the finger at him. mm -hmm. He also said something similar to another doctor he worked with. So he's, like, going around and telling just everybody. He's putting it in everyone's mind that he yep. didn't do it. So right. that when they ask him, they're going to be like, but oh, no, yeah, he totally. He wouldn't do it. And, you know, like, don't you guys framed. know that someone broke, broke into, into his, his house? house? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Rule number one, that dude's always guilty. Yeah. yeah. When this is happening, just so you know, if someone's coming around saying, I was accused of this and uh, I'm pretty sure everything was planted and, like, it's really looking not great for him, he's probably. Probably he probably did it. it. It's never a mannequin. It's never a mannequin. <laughs> <laughs> Around the 1st of March, his lawyer um, contacts the police to state that he, that he, the lawyer, had received an anonymous letter about the case. 
The letter was written in pencil on plain white paper that had been in an envelope. The envelope was addressed to his attorney at the law firm and was postmarked February 27, 1999. The letter was in block printing and states, I shot Miriam. <laughs> and goes on to state, <laughs> it was, it's, it's all in caps. Um, yeah, go, very aggressive. He goes, I shot Miriam. And goes on to state that the Lord ordered the writer oh, to right. harvest the wicked racist ones of this town. Oh, my. The letter goes on to say that they that they made it look like Richard had k- killed Miriam and signs the letter soldier of equality, soldier of God, soldier of death. Stop it. Wow. This dude is as bad as BTK already. I already hate him. He's annoying. The officer noticed that there were streaks across the page showing that something had been wiped across it. The officer also noticed that about one inch of hair was stuck between the flap and the exterior of the envelope and then partially within the envelope. They removed the hair for testing and tried to fingerprint the letter and the envelope, but there were no prints because it had been clearly wiped. Hmm. On May 4th of 1999, Richard's attorney contacts police to say that a second letter had been received. Same deal as the first, but this one says, Dr. Illis could not have been the killer of his evil wife. (laughs) And that the author's superior intellect has Uh, fooled the police into thinking it was Richard. uh, The errors in his last letter were deliberate to hide his identity. And he brags about having advanced degrees, being fluent in several languages, and that his IQ is twice as high as any police officer. Wow. Then he apologized for ruining Dr. Richard's life and states, I had free access to his home while he was on vacation and used many of his supplies to fabricate my equipment. The letter closes by saying that this will be the last letter because he is moving out of the area and he signs the letter soldier of equality, soldier of God, soldier of death. You know, the fact that he thinks that he has double the IQ of any police officer and still thinks that this is going to work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, the yeah. fact that he is so blatantly making up a person <laughs> and then saying, oh, yeah, I did break into his house and I did all this yes. and you shouldn't blame him. You shouldn't blame me. him. I got all of these things from, I inside, did his from inside of his house. I'm framing him. He's a wonderful man. He's a wonderful man. I love him. It's just so I'm weird. So, I'm so sorry I ruined his life. <sighs> it's such bullshit. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's so crazy. <sighs> Gross. It, like it gets weirder, man. Although these letters are pretty, pretty freaking weird. So at this point, now they've received two letters and they're looking at him. The one trooper remembers that he'd seen that this book on the nightstand. They write their own sentences, FBI handwriting analysis manual. That book um, actually contains information on anonymous and disguised writing. The book talks about using pencil to disguise writing because it can't be chemically tested. Like where you could test the ink in a pen. Oh. You can't test pencils because the lead is chemically inert. It also talks about using block letters to disguise writing because it's difficult to compare. The book also included several scenarios where, you know, this block lettering was used or written. And um, the scenario of these letters was very similar to the fourth scenario in the book. Like, this guy is not... He's just copying it, like, exactly. They were able to show that Richard had purchased the book in August of 1998. Four months before her murder. Four or five months. Premeditation. Yeah. (laughs) He's going to keep premeditation. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Okay. (laughs) This is where it gets fun. So the letters were reviewed by an FBI agent with the Behavioral Analysis Unit at Quantico. And I'm totally going to say Quantico. The agent later testified that he had found similarities between the documents. He compared the spacing of the letter and like there it goes into extreme detail on like the spacing between the letters and the height, you know, of the letters. And he did find similarities between the documents. He compared the spacing of the letters against known handwriting of Richard. 
He found that Richard's writing exhibited idiosyncratic writing style that showed common writing style and habits between the two documents. One of the big things was his habit of omitting words. And I don't know if this is like a central PA thing, but I do it too. So, and I do it because like sometimes I'll be typing and I will leave out a, a word that I meant to say and I thought in my head, but I just didn't type. Also, we say things like, oh, my car needs washed. And I never thought that that was weird. But my friend was like, your car needs, needs to, to be, be washed. washed. So I, I don't know. Maybe it's a Pennsylvania thing. But the agent, the FBI agent said that the phenomenon of doing this is extremely rare. And I'm like, oh, no. I like how it's a phenomenon. Phenomenon. Like, I actually have dramatic. it in quotations because that is phenomenon. what he said. The no, phenomenon. Phenomenon. Um, oh. Your John Travolta phenomenon. John Travolta is so <laughs> creepy. I used to love him and now I'm just creepy. Do you know that his aunt lives in Coeur d'Alene? Oma yes. tells me every single time I go there. Oh, yes, Mom. and his That's cousin so is Molly of Dave Ken and Molly. So do you remember how I told you guys that Richard had talked to one of his colleagues about the search at his house? He told them that the state police were trying to nail him for Miriam's murder and told him the same story about the house being broken into and being particularly concerned that they had gotten into stuff to make the silencer and planted things around the house to make him look they guilty. They found all my Michael's receipts. Uh. Right. So at this point in the investigation, the state police let his co-worker see these anonymous letters the first letter made the inference that miriam was a racist this co-worker who's african-american had known miriam for years and knew that she was not a racist she'd embraced him and never given any indication directly or indirectly of having any kind of you know being against anybody when he read the second letter the like i'm smarter and i speak fluently multiple languages and all yada da he realized that he was being set up for killing Miriam. The letter had mentioned several advanced degrees, being fluent in several languages, and leaving the area, which they were packing his house to move, and access to Richard's house, all which applied to him. <laughs> this coworker is like, ah! uh-huh. Additionally, by insinuating that Miriam was a racist, which would possibly give him motive but unfortunately for Dr. Dick this doctor had an airtight alibi so the police at this point they'd found a cigarette butt behind Miriam's house they found a hair in the silencer they found hair in the glue of one of the envelopes from the letter and we haven't gotten to it yet but they're gonna find hair on some tennis shoes they had tested everything for DNA the DNA from the cigarette butt didn't match Richard. None of the none of the DNA rich none of the DNA matched Richard, but none of the DNA matched any of the other DNA. So <laughs> the silencer <laughs> contained a hair and it was left where it would obviously be found. The letter, which had been wiped clean of prints, has a hair, you know, oh and like the the stamp and the like mm-hmm. the letter part weren't licked they were wetted but but we hair, left a hair but a hair just happens to yeah. be i actually thought stuck about in the that glue. you would never send an envelope and see a hair in it and be no. like i'm just gonna send it <laughs> i'd be like ooh, ooh, like get a new envelope like not even a dna thing. no it's just gross <laughs> it's just gross you wouldn't wipe everything down and then be like mm, that's fine while the police are like okay yeah it doesn't match richard they also don't believe that, like, three or four different people are involved in the murder of this woman who had no enemies There's other literally, than like, her husband. There's literally, like, one gunshot, and that's basically it. And yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. like, but it was seven people. It was a mob. And they came, right. and they just mm-hmm. took her out. Yeah. Cult, and I don't yeah. even know. At this point, the DA decides that... This is all just circumstantial evidence. There's nothing to tie this upstanding member of the community, a doctor, like who's, you know, one of the best in his field. There's there's no there's nothing to charge him with. And so he won't bring charges against Such Dr. Dick. And so the case goes cold. But but, but on June 4th of 1999, a guy who was out on State Route 554, was a fisherman and he was looking for minnow in a nearby creek when he finds a small rifle. He notices that it's loaded. So he removes the clip 
and he takes the rifle to the South Williamsport Police. So once he gets to the to the South Williamsport Police, he takes the officer out to show him where he found the rifle, and it was on the bank about 15 to 20 feet from the road. The clip was for a 22 Hornet, which is an unusual caliber. The barrel was sawed off and had a scope, but it did not have a bolt. I don't know what that means. Me I think it's, but it um, was in the court documents. <laughs> I feel embarrassed that I think I know why what this is what it is, and it's not because I own a gun; it's because I play Fallout. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the it's the you're shooting and you have to go like this this thing, the bolt action rifle. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally knew that because Fallout. Eventually, uh, they were able to match like you know the grooves and all the whatever the ballistic experts do two fragments from miriam's body and they also found that the silencer fit that weapon perfectly mm, a homemade silencer so we're gonna sidebar and we're gonna talk about a couple of people so the first person we're gonna talk about is uncle joe uncle joe uncle joe so remember i said i, I really couldn't find anything about richard's life before this story and i just think that you know just like he this is the only thing he ever really did in his life other than being, you know, a good surgeon. So there just, there isn't like this history like we see on a lot of the other people. But he did have a very close relationship with a man he called Uncle Joe. But he had actually told a friend that Joe was his biological father. So whether or not that's mm-hmm. true, don't know. Uncle Joe was already passed. So this relationship would end up being another link to Richard as being the murderer. The police had interviewed Uncle Joe's sister to get background on Joe because he died in 1998. He had been a gunsmith in the military and he bought and sold guns regularly. I mean, even after he had passed, there were t- he had two gun safes. One of the things, though, that he had done before... Sola? Louie! <laughs> the police had interviewed Uncle Joe's sister to get background on Joe. He had been a gunsmith in the military. He had two gun safes and bought and sold guns regularly. And, because he was a good planner, he had given his sister a list of the guns he owned before he died in 1998. Wow, what so, a responsible dude. Yeah, so she hands this list over to police. Now, just as they were finishing up, the police notice a photograph of Joe standing in a field holding a groundhog. Groundhog? Groundhog? Groundhog. <laughs> and a gun resting on the ground. <laughs> Spoiler alert! It was the same guy. Oh, what? <laughs> they had found on the creek bed. As it turns out, Dr. Dick was the executor of Uncle Joe's estate. And he had passed. Ooh. The back of that photo had a date of 1947, and the court documents go into excruciating detail about the gun and the type of gun and when it was manufactured and da 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 da. But apparently, um, if you want to murder someone with a gun that can't be traced, um, apparently, if you pick a gun that is before like 1949. There aren't going to be any records because they can't. They are like probably grandfathered into a a before a certain point. People just guns willy nilly. I mean, shoot your eye out. (laughs) (laughs) So the next person we're going to talk about is Catherine. Catherine had met Richard briefly in 1992 when she was training as a perfusionist. So the same job Miriam had. So in 1995, after Miriam had had their son. She actually called Catherine and invited her to come and work for Richard because she was going to be staying home with the kid. So um, Catherine agrees and comes to work at Williamsport Hospital with Richard, for Richard. In February of 1998, Richard tells Catherine that he has separated from Miriam and by March she and Richard were in a relationship. By May or June of that year, she had already moved in with him. She got this job. Because of Miriam. And then... Wow. <laughs> like, How much rage would you feel? Oh, my God. Right? So, around Thanksgiving um, of that year, which is 1998, so, again, right about the time that um, you know Miriam could have murdered, um, around Thanksgiving, she decided that she was going to go visit her family in the Midwest. And Richard decided that he was going to take uh, a week off of work as well, even though he wasn't going with her. So, he was like, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to take a week off. I'll have a staycation while you're visiting your family. Staycation murdering. Staycation. 
Uh, after the murder, he starts telling Catherine that someone has a vendetta against him, and oh, he is God, in. He thinks same. that they, he's in danger, and so she's freaked out. I mean, they're living together, so she's like, "Dude, let's turn the alarm on." And he's like, mm, "But if I turn the alarm on, I have to sign up for a six month or a year contract, oh, and uh, we're looking at moving to a different house. Oh, I just don't want to. Just don't want to do that." But I mean, like, if you were really afraid for your life, wouldn't that be worth it to you? Would you be like, I'm really scared for my life, but I don't really want to pay for the alarm. Six months. I literally put in my notes, they're moving to a new house. He doesn't want to pay for a six month or year contract to turn it back on. Period. Um, dot, 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 dot. (laughs) So then, you know, the police searched the house and so Richard told Catherine that he was worried that the police were going to arrest him based on pressure from the media and he thought that the letters the the anonymous letters that the police had gotten proved that he did not kill Miriam and that he was really hoping that they were going to find DNA or fingerprints on those letters knowing full well they weren't going to find fingerprints because he had wiped them off he knew that the DNA wasn't going to match him and you know where he got the DNA from like who knows? Patience. Yeah. Who knows? So weird. Look, there's a hair in the sink in the hospital bathroom. Yeah. I'm just going to take that. Right? <laughs> I mean, it was weird because, like, one of the hairs was a pubic hair. <gasps> yeah. I know. He's oh, like, I know. do you think I while know. someone was in surgery, he's like, who? Yeah. <laughs> who knows? He just, like, pops it right in his pocket. So she later testified that Richard had told her that from the time he was a teenager and throughout his life, that Uncle Joe had given him had given him guns. In June of 1999, Richard and Catherine had gone to see an attorney in Harrisburg. Like, she was just with him, but he went to go see this attorney. And that the attorney had given him a bunch of papers. And Catherine asked what they were. And he told her that it was a list of countries that didn't have extradition treaties with the U.S. The same month, he got a passport for his son and purchased a book called How to Hide Your Assets and Disappear. <laughs> In my notes again, I'm like, has this guy not heard of paying cash? I'm like, why are you using your credit card to buy oh these God. books that are clearly implicating like, what you? What the fuck? Yeah. What Did he have fuck? a how-to for dummies? The killing your <laughs> wife? How-to <laughs> murder for dummies. Right. Seriously. Also, so, who writes a book about how to disappear? Is that like a weird? That's like that's an yeah. odd so thing. Fucking weird. Do you think it's not by an author? Do you think it's just like <laughs> how to disappear by nobody? Hide <laughs> uh-huh. your assets. Uh-huh. You disappear. <laughs> it's like so weird. So this yeah. is another like weirdy thing. So in July of ninety nine, Catherine had taken their the son to get his hair cut, and the hairdresser was like, "Hey, it looks like this kid's been cutting his own hair." Super weird, right? So she mentions this to Richard in passing. He doesn't say anything, but then comes to her later that evening and is like, I think that Miriam's family has been cutting his hair to drug test it because the night that they had gotten back and learned of the murder, that he was so inconsolable that Richard had given him a controlled substance to sleep. What? And this is just a sidebar but later they found that the hair that was in the letter was his was his i was literally gonna say there were chops of the fucking yeah what a loser god this fucking fucking douche yeah she also testified that around the time of the murder richard had been interviewing um for a position in like what's mi michigan yeah flint yeah it was flint michigan um because he wanted to leave the area and they probably wanted to get away from his crime. Catherine, good old Catherine, married him on July 31st of 1999. Damn it, Catherine. They were married for two years <laughs> and then divorced. Good. Towards the end of their marriage, he started calling her a greedy bitch, of just course. as he had done with Miriam. So she's pretty lucky that she's still alive. She's still alive. Mm-hmm. So the police had found the gun and they were like, well, Let's go back and drive this route again because the route where they found the gun was the same route that Richard had taken to get to his sister's house. And so they drive it again, and this time they find the sneakers. And these sneakers are size 14, and they match the pattern of the tracks around Miriam's house, and the heel had a distinct horseshoe type pattern. The sneakers were found two tenths of a mile from where the gun was found. The soles were 13 inches, which matched the impressions from Miriam's house. And once they had the shoes back at the police barrack for processing, 
They collected hair and fibers in the tongue of the shoe. Both the sneakers and the murder weapon are found a quarter of a mile from the route that Richard took that night. Still, the district attorney felt that it was too circumstantial. Are they like BFFs? They were able to match fibers from the shoes to fibers that they had collected from a handheld vacuum that they had seized um, during the first search of his (laughs) home. Nice. Yeah. And there's really, really detailed information in that YouTube video um, about how they figured this out. They could tell based on like where Richard had made certain cell phone calls and also they the police redrove his route in similar like weather conditions and they were like even with conditions like this like there's no way it should have taken him you Uh know three hours when it would normally take an hour and a half this whole trip out of town was his alibi i couldn't have murdered her i was on my way up here i wasn't even in town but through all this they were able to show like yeah, he absolutely could have been the one to do it. Richard left Williamsport in November of 2000, supposedly to get away from the media scrutiny. But in all honesty, like the scandal in a small town Mm -hmm. of murdering your wife, like his once very lucrative practice, like nobody was going to him. So he briefly moved to take a job in Laredo, Texas, near the U.S.-Mexico border. And somebody had asked him if he was like, intending to flee and he was like if i was gonna flee i wouldn't go to somewhere you know da, 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 da. something like he wouldn't go somewhere that would extradite or he wouldn't go somewhere like so obvious as mexico because he's so smart but uh, he wasn't he was not um smart no he, he was not smart <laughs> but he was also only stayed in laredo texas for a few months because then he moved to liberty lake washington <gasps> together it all comes together so for those of you who live outside of spokane and don't know liberty lake is just a town that's spokane essentially yeah Yeah. wow i didn't see that one coming (laughs) i did not neither did i coming i was just like i'm gonna do the story about somebody from my hometown and then i'm like holy shit it was just like that is he came to spokane and he moved there when 2000 Uh, march of 2001 where he tried to join a surgery group but when he showed up for his interview the administrator of the office had received a package full of newspaper clippings and all <laughs> kinds of stuff and warning her oh, not to hire Richard. Oh, do, do they yeah. know who sent it? Mm-mm. That's apparently, amazing. Apparently a few pa- practices like all over the place Could received packages like that. imagine getting a package? Oh, my God. oh bitch, yeah. someone is out to get you. You are not going to get mean, away with that. I have to admit, there is a sweet, sweet karmic sweet revenge. Yeah. Just, oh. Oh, I know we're it. not supposed to hope for revenge upon people and we're supposed to love everybody, but sometimes yeah, I, I mean, just yeah. love I, that he is fucked. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> from someone he doesn't even know. I mean, I just think that that's awesome. And this all stems from the I fact that he didn't want to pay her $13,000 a month in child support and yeah, spousal exactly. support. Yep. And I'm just like, okay, but now you have no money because your luc- lucrative practice dried up. And every time you try to go in and get a job Yeah, now, like you can't even get a job at McDonald's. Yeah, like, so they're you know, like, you can't don't get a hire job. this guy. So um, when it didn't work out to join that practice, he decided to his, open his own deal. And he opened Valley Cosmetic Surgery Center. In December of 2002, police obtained an arrest warrant for Richard and traveled to Spokane, and he was arrested for the murder of Miriam. And, like, Spokane police had been, like, surveilling him day and night at at the request of Pennsylvania State Police. And then once, as soon as they got the arrest warrant, they flew out here and they served him with that arrest warrant with the assistance of the Spokane Police Department. And he was arrested for the murder of Miriam. Um, He did not fight the extradition back to Pennsylvania. On December 18th of 2002, one of the Pennsylvania troopers was involved in a search of Richard's house in Liberty Lake. During this search, they found woodworking equipment, a drill press, the the same stuff the police had found in his PA home, along with a table saw and a bandsaw. They also observed several firearms um, and police, like several of those firearms were on the list of Uncle Joe's gun or guns that he had gotten, that they had gotten from Uncle Joe's sister. Well, that was a garbled mess of words, Mm. but I think you understand where I was going. Yeah. So Mm. yes, four of the guns were on that list and one even had Joe's initials engraved on the trigger guard. 
and the book How to Hide Your Assets and Disappear <laughs> was just on his bookshelf. Okay, this is my... If I can have a favorite part of this story, this is my favorite part because of all the fucked up, stupid shit that he did that he thought made him look innocent and yet made him look more guilty. This is the this is the, the icing creme on the cake. De la creme. Okay. So they seized his home computer, and on the computer they find two chapters of an unfinished manuscript oh. entitled <laughs> Heart Shot, oh, Murder no. of a Doctor's Wife. With the author listed as Richard W. Ills, M.D. Oh, my God. The first <laughs> chapter was entitled The Shot No One Heard. <laughs> and the second chapter was entitled The Road to Williamsport. Oh, my God. This what? guy. This is the, this is a guy who removes his ribs so he can suck his own dick. Yep. Yeah, I'm yep. sorry. I'm just like, looking at you like you're laughing so hard. I'm literally like, I can't. Like what a fucking loser! <laughs> like what a fucking more like, like how up your own ass. Oh. And you pay. Oh. But wait, but There's wait. More. God, he makes me tired. Oh my God. In the manuscript, he describes his life with Miriam, oh no. and he alludes to potential suspects to the murder. Well, I mean, of this is he does. this is very OJ. Uh, OJ his, is his book. If I did if it, I had book, done it, or yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. Because he doesn't say that he is the killer, but he describes the killer's thoughts and actions. Which is exactly what you do if you ever watch any type of show, is the, the police will be like, what do you think the killer thought? Yeah. And they'll be like, I think he Whoa. probably made his own silencer out of... <laughs> he says that the, quote unquote, killer knew that the investigation would be difficult for authorities and how the killer on prior occasions stalked Miriam and was waiting for the right shot to present itself and noted that when Miriam was killed, it was the seventh night the killer had waited outside. Remember that week he took off? <laughs> he described how earlier attempts were ruined by unforeseen events, like when two weeks before the murder, Miriam's dog smelled him as, quote, the wind blew through the house just as he was about to take aim and how lu- how it was lucky that Miriam hadn't called the cops because they would have seen the footprints in the snow and knew she was and would have known that she was being stalked. Wow. He wrote in the manuscript how the killer had taken measures to, quote, confound them and lead them down the wrong path multiple times. He just thinks he's so clever. Thinks he's so fucking and clever. And he's not. Like, no. no part of them is questioning anything. They're like, mm-hmm. He vividly describes the shooting of Miriam by the killer, studying his rifle on a tree limb while she was talking on the phone, only having 10 minutes to escape the area, his car being just down the street and escaping into the night. He also describes tossing a cigarette in the snow just before the shooting. Was it just literally because? Yeah, I mean, like he just he he just wanted to confuse. He thought like throwing that and having. I mean, he just picked up a used cigarette from from somebody. Literally just thought. Yeah, he he thought he was smart. He thought he was really smart. The manuscript also describes the quote unquote assassin unscrewing the silencer and walking to the portal of death to confirm that he didn't need to shoot again. The portal of death to concern to confirm he didn't need to shoot again. It said, quote, the killer made his way to the worth of his waiting car and felt an almost orgasmic catharsis as he congratulated himself on another mission well done. After all, to him, killing was better than sex. Wow. Richard claimed that he was writing the book as a way to get interest in the case and to get the real facts about the case out there. But I mean, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Jesus. Come on. Uh, anyway, that's my favorite part. So there was only two chapters. Um, I am not aware that if he has finished the book at this point, but um, there were only two chapters at that point. So they take him to trial. The trial lasts five weeks. In February of 2004, the jury went into deliberation and was there for two and a half days. At the end of the second night, the foreman came back to the judge saying that they were hopelessly deadlocked. But the judge told them to keep trying to reach a unanimous verdict. Mm. The jury had asked for several portions of testimony to be reread to them. It was specifically about the inheritance of the guns from Uncle Joe and, in particular, the inheritance of the gun that was used in the murder. And again, there was a lot of detail about the gun and the year and like how rare it was of a gun and et cetera, et cetera. In the end, they did come up with a guilty verdict. But. 
when all the jurors were like when they were having to go around and say if they were if they thought guilty or not guilty one juror hesitated and gave their reply but then had to repeat it and so they of course used that as you know a reason for appeal later no, on no. a guilty verdict meant an immediate life in prison imprisonment sentence he apparently showed no emotion when the verdict was read but a week after he was convicted he attempted suicide by cutting himself with a pen oh fucking hell. his lawyer too and like so they had interviewed his lawyer and his lawyer was like I'm not surprised, Richard. You know, I've seen him in this last few weeks and he's just been despondent. And again, in my notes, I wrote, boo fucking who? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't give a shit if he's despondent. Like, he murdered his wife. Anyway, he's filed numerous appeals. They've all been denied. In 2010, he filed a lawsuit against 11 Department of Correction officers because he said he was beaten food deprived and he had lost 20 pounds because whatever prison he was in like they had to stand in their cell doorway to receive their meals and his back is so sore he couldn't get from the bed to the cell door in time to receive his meals Holy and yet shit. he never complained about not getting any meals um he didn't his back pain didn't prohibit him from going to the exercise yard or the library or the visitor rooms he oh. he yes oh, he, <laughs> I feel so bad. he never asked for any disability accommodation and the only thing was that like they were like yes he did request a particular medication for his back which they said no to but they had offered a replacement which he declined. He lost that case too. Oh, so good. Um, Dr. Dick still maintains his innocence. But I mean, is there like any doubt out there? Like, did you find anything about people? No. <laughs> I mean, there's not. Any, I, I'm I just actually, curious. I actually read through. So a lot of this information came from one of his appeals, actually. And I it was 138 pages and I read them all. And I actually wow. read several of the other appeals as well. And they explain very clearly why, like, none of these things. Like, you know, he tried to say that they shouldn't have been able to take his trash. And of course, you know, I mean, like, there was precedent for all of these things. And I mean, really minor things that he tried to pick apart. And he has not gotten a new trial because um he's a dumbass yeah i mean it's uh, <laughs> i mean it's pretty clear and like what how sick of a fuck do you have to be that you used your own child's like you planted that's really gross your own child's yeah. hair we used you tried to frame like you first. called your child over and said I'm just going to, like, cut your hair or whatever. Like, knowing what you were going to do with it. Like, yeah. that's your kid. That yeah. is your Or even if he mom. did it in his sleep. It's Oh, yeah. I guess and even, even so, it's like you're doing this to frame. And even by Richard's own admission, Miriam was a great mom. This all came down to the fact that he didn't want to pay her $13,000. Like, he could have cut ties with her, walked away, you know, yeah, he would have had to pay child support until until the son was 18. But, you know, if she got remarried, the spousal support would have ended. Like, they could, mm -hmm. you know, like. There were now, way many other solutions. There were so yeah. many yeah. other yeah. solutions other than murder. You know yeah. where the son is? I don't. Um, so there there were a lot of legal proceedings. Um, so I think I found out that he lives somewhere in Colorado, I believe. You know, and I read some things about, like. They did finally get to interview him when he was like seven, but he couldn't really, rem I mean, it was two years later. He couldn't really remember anything. So like he couldn't give any testimony that backed up anything. Yeah. He was like, I don't remember if we went to Burger King or McDonald's, but I don't know. My dad knows. And, yeah. You know, it's that kind of stuff. After Miriam passed and then Richard went to jail, I think temporary custody had been granted to Miriam's sister. And he tried to fight that. He tried to get somebody in his family. And they had petitioned the court and said something like, this is no different than if he was on a business trip. And I'm like, mm, it's a little different. I think it's probably a little different. <laughs> it's a little different. I mean, uh... He uh, is in, you know, prison. But uh, so I don't know. I don't really know what happened with mm -hmm. the son. Um, I didn't I didn't really want to look too much up on him only because, again, 
just he, to me he's a victim you know as well and i try again i tried really hard there were a lot of like troopers involved in all these different games and i just know that if i was involved in something like this i wouldn't want particularly like the doctor that was his partner that he tried to frame like i don't want to yeah. use that guy's name and have people yeah. looking him up and like because he did nothing wrong other than the fact that he worked with a narcissistic yeah. idiot but yeah so that is the story with a weird Spokane connection. Yeah, with a weird Spokane I had, ending. I had no idea. I had literally no idea that until I started so researching crazy. the story that he ended up in Spokane. That's so so weird. it's like my two hometowns. Yeah. I knew the I twist she told me. I did. Oh, I'm the only one. I had no idea yeah. what this was going into it. Yeah. I did not see that coming. That is the story of Dr. Richard. Asshole of the week. Uh, and um, the untimely and so sad um, death of Miriam, who did not deserve that. And it makes me sad to think that, like, even right up to the end, she was still, like, wanting to reconcile for the sake of her family. God, how's the friend she was on the phone with? Yeah, oh I God, mean. that poor lady. I don't, you know, I don't think you would ever get over Ooh, I can't even imagine like, hearing imagine. yourself and I mean to hear that and be like oh my god are you okay I told Michael the limit for calling the police for me is six hours I'm like if it's six hours and I you <laughs> haven't you can't get a hold of me and nobody knows where I am I have been captured <laughs> okay I'm like I love that you actually seriously had a I did I'm like Michael about because this. all the stories you hear all yeah, the stories you hear are true. this person went missing so I'm like I'm telling you if six hours has passed and I have not answered your phone calls, your text, you don't know where I am, I am in someone's trunk. <laughs> I yeah. promise. Yeah. So that I is actually, my rule, six hours. I actually knew a guy that got kidnapped um, <laughs> and put in a trunk. Actually, I've known a couple people that have been Of course kidnapped. you have. What um, is I, your life? Where I just, you know, you? because back in my, um, back in my <laughs> youth, I used to drink a lot more. And I'm a kind of a social butterfly when I have a couple cocktails and I meet all kinds of people. That's true. That's so I met this talent. kid, Chad, and he, when, when I was in Charleston and he had been kidnapped and um, I think mistaken or something like, or, or no, I, maybe it was a carjacking, but they had put him in the trunk. And um, that's how I learned that you can kick out like the, 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 tail, the, the tail light. light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he got out and jumped out of the moving car, but that's how he got away. And then I had another friend who... They were, it was her and a, and a friend and they were doing like a road trip somewhere. Um, and they pulled over to get, they had stopped to get gas and this guy got in the car with them and had a gun and was like, okay, you're going to drive here. And, um, he kept my friend in the car while the <gasps> other girl had, he like, he took her to like a gas, another gas station at an ATM, made her go in and get, yeah, it was super fucked up. And, um, he kept them for like eight hours and then finally let them go. And um, so they had to testify and everything. But what's really fucked up is that, you know, when you go to court for something like this, um, they get all your information. Mm -hmm. So he used to call Jenny from prison. <gasps> and like she would just like answer the phone and be like, you have a call from inmate. Da -da 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 -da. Nope. nope. And he would he would just call her like nope. like just to mess with her and nope. like intimidate God, her. People are nope. terrible. Yeah. Nope. I met a guy once go. that was in the second building of 9-11. Yeah, I met him on an airplane. Oh, he was a nope. construction worker. <laughs> he was doing not want to have that construction on like the third floor, like a low enough floor that when it was he said he was in the building when it got hit, but they were low enough to the ground that they were able to get out before it collapsed. Yeah. Because he said he heard it. He heard the first, they heard, they heard and they saw the first one get hit and they felt it. And then he got like a call thingy on like his walkie saying like an airplane just went into the first building and they were like, you need to get out like right now. And as wow. he was on his little walkie thing, uh, the second plane came. How old were you in nine, during 9-11? I was 93. So is that eight, nine, eight? Yeah. I'm college. old enough to remember it, I though. I remember school. being in uh, second grade in Miss Campbell's class. And I remember it being on the news. And I didn't really know what was going on. But all the adults were like, mm -hmm. you know. And I remember it being on the news all day. And I was at school. But, like, no one was at school. Everyone just watched the news all day. Yeah, I, I stayed was... home. 
I yeah, was in school. I was in my junior like, year of college. Like, I had been in class, and it's like, I get out of class, and I have, like, 60 messages, like, voicemails on my on my phone. And I'm like, what the hell is happening? And then I called, and my mom was like, where, you know, where are you? And I'm like, oh, I just got out of class. She's like, you know, a plane hit. It, it, and I think at that point, they still weren't sure if it was, like, an accident. They didn't know if it was a, they, yeah, they knew, or yeah. If I, it was if it was a terrorist attack. And my mom was that. like, you need to find a TV. And so I had gone down to where my next class was, and I walked in. And I walked in just as the second plane was hitting. And I, mean, I just remember standing there and being like, what the fuck? I mean, like, it was... I can't I tell you how many people motion. how many people were in that room and it was dead silent. Like sure. there was no I mean, I think by the time, you know, there was like that initial like <gasps> you know, gasp, but then it was completely silent and Well, and then it's like the second the second one hit, that was the moment that everyone's like, Oh my god, this is intentional. Like this yeah, is this not is an accident. Oh, like no, it wasn't. I didn't see the second plane hit. I saw the I walked in as the As it fell. As, as it the building fell. fell. That's insane. Uh so that was Dr. Dick. That was Dr. Dick and a nine eleven recap yeah, of where we were. Recap. So that is yeah. You can follow us on Instagram at Freeze of Crime. Mm-hmm. You can email us at freezacrime at gmail.com. You can follow us on Podbean and Spotify and all over the place. And yeah. also leave us five stars. And if you leave us anything less, I will literally... She's going to start will. getting the books from How to Kill People. Yeah. For Dennis, How to from Disappear. The She's <laughs> going to hide her assets and disappear. Yeah, assets. She's going to Google... Uh, well, I can tell you right now, I don't have $600,000 to hide. So sorry. <laughs> We don't. We we only have one patron. So <laughs> no, we're we just, not going anywhere. Yeah. Tell us. Give us some feedback. Let yeah. us know what yeah. you think of the stories. If there's a story you really want to hear. Okay. We're done. Have fun, big fan. Okay. Bye. bye.